Hi everybody, thank you very much for coming out and thank you for giving me the opportunity to speak to you today about this subject that I consider is vitally important uh, for our children and for the future of our country. Uh, I'm going to talk a little bit about what's in the book, Crimes of the Educators, that was written by uh, Dr. Blumenfeld and myself, and then uh, talk a little bit about the history in terms of how we got to this disaster that we're in when it comes to education. Um, so just to start with, I would like to talk a little bit about Samuel Blumenfeld. He was the co-author of the book and he deserves most of the credit. Um, unfortunately, he passed away last week, but uh, his legacy is going to live on. He was a great man. I consider him to be a real hero. Um, you know, he was a pioneer in the field of education. He wrote ten books on education, exposing the government schools, the whole word reading method that I'll talk to you about today, and, uh, and so much else. Uh, he actually fought in World War II, so he died at the age of 89, and he was a great patriot, and um, like I said, I'm sure his legacy is going to live on. Uh, one of the things he used to say often, and he wrote this in some of his columns and in the book, uh, it's easier to believe a credible lie than an incredible truth. And so uh, we argue that this is one of the reasons why the information that we have in the book has managed to remain hidden. Uh, it's not that it's a secret, it's just that the information and the truth is so incredible that to believe it is earth-shattering. I mean, you have to do something about it. Our children are being dumbed down on purpose. It was deliberate. It was outlined in a specific plan. And the purpose of it was to overthrow our government, overthrow our liberties, and move us toward a collectivist, utopian society. So Sam really was a pioneer in this. He was a friend. Uh, and again, he deserves most of the credit for this book and so much more credit than he'll probably ever get. There's probably uh, unknown amounts of people in this country who can read because of his efforts. And I'll tell you a little bit about uh, some of the things he discovered and some of the things he publicized uh, that we talk about in the book. Um, so the, the main premise of the book, Crimes of the Educators, as the name might suggest, is that uh, the educators, and by that we don't mean teachers, I'm a teacher, I, you know, I have no uh, beef against teachers, uh, what we argue is actually that teachers are just as much victims as the students who are being dumbed down for the most part. When we say crimes of the educators, we mean the education establishment. We mean the people at the top of the pyramid, the people who run the government education system, the people who control it, the people who set the so-called standards and uh, are deliberately working to dumb down our children. And I know a lot of this probably sounds very outrageous. Deliberately dumbing down our children? Really? That's crazy. How could that even happen? But uh, we have the primary source documents that it's happening. And you can see the evidence all around you. Uh, I mean, look at our society. It's falling apart. People don't know their history. People can't read. Uh, this isn't an accident. It wasn't a national accident. It was a deliberate plan. And so we argue that there's specific crimes being perpetrated against our country, against our children, against our people. Uh, by this education establishment. And of course the education establishment doesn't operate in isolation. It's connected to the broader establishment. But um, I want to talk a little bit about these crimes that, uh, that we identify in the book. The first and obviously the most serious is treason. Uh, I'm sure you guys realize treason is a very serious crime and we don't use the word lightly. <coughs> um, but we argue that deliberately dumbing down the population of a nation for the purpose of taking away their liberties, overthrowing their constitution, overthrowing their form of government, and reducing them to serfdom is treason. Uh, you know, the Ronald Reagan put together a commission on education in 1983. We'll talk a little bit more about that in a moment. But they said that if a foreign power had imposed this disaster on us, we might well have viewed it as an act of war. And Sam and I argue that we should view it as an act of war. Just because foreigners didn't do it uh, doesn't make it any less an act of war. It's designed to subvert our country, our republic, and dumb down our children, and therefore it is an act of war against our people. Um, we also argue uh, child abuse because, uh, as I'll talk in a little moment when I get to whole word versus phonics, um, they are deliberately harming the minds of the children and not just in a metaphysical sense. There is physical damage that you can now see with a brain scan. Modern science has given us the tools where we can document this evidence concretely. Um, in terms of what the educators are doing to the children. And I'll uh, explain that a little bit in more depth when I get to uh, the section on whole word versus phonics. Um, contributing to the delinquency of a minor. Uh, we argue that teaching pornographic sex education to children when they're in kindergarten, this contributes to premarital sex, to abortion, to the collapse of our society, to venereal disease. Um, and this is 
uh, in our opinion, contributing to the delinquency of a minor. And there's other ways that that happens as well, and we've identified them under um, separate crimes. Uh, then we have destroying belief in biblical religion. Uh, children are born with a belief in God. Uh, studies show this. You don't brainwash a kid to believe in God. You have to brainwash the kid not to believe in God. So the natural tendency is for a human to say, I have a creator, I have a purpose. The schools are deliberately destroying that, and they're uh, replacing biblical religion and belief in the creator with uh, atheism and humanism and nihilism and even Satanism. And uh, this is not appropriate. This is not what our tax dollars should be used for. And uh, we consider it a crime. Uh, drug pushing. So the schools are inducing all sorts of disorders in children, including dyslexia, including attention deficit disorder, including ADHD with the hyperactivity there. And uh, in response to these school-induced disorders, the, the education establishment is pushing hardcore psychotropic drugs on the children. Uh, and when I say hardcore psychotropic drugs, I'm not exaggerating. Uh, if you look at the ingredient list on some of these drugs that they give to children, to little children, now I think it's one in ten uh, boys in American public schools are taking these drugs. These are hard amphetamines. This is stuff that you could buy from a drug dealer that would be a crime if you sold it without the permission of a so-called psychiatrist. And the schools are forcing these children to take these dangerous drugs. If you look at the warning labels of these drugs, they can lead to uh, addiction, to lifelong dependence, potentially irreversible harm, suicidal thoughts, homicidal thoughts. You don't push this kind of stuff on children, especially not to deal with problems that you created in the first place and to enrich uh, pharmaceutical companies in collusion with government. Um, then we have uh, fraud and extortion. If a businessman came to you and said, uh, hey, I have this product that's going to do such and such, and you bought the product and it did the opposite, what would you consider that to be? That person would have defrauded you of your money. They would have extorted you of your money. We have the education establishment doing the exact same thing today. They're telling us, give us your money. We're going to educate your children. They're doing the exact opposite. They're creating lifelong learning disabilities in the children, and they are miseducating the children. They are indoctrinating them with false propaganda, a false version of history. They're harming their minds. They're deliberately creating illiteracy. And, uh, you know, that's the opposite of what government schools are marketed as doing. The same with Common Core. They tell us this is going to improve education. This is going to make our kids ready for college and career. Uh, that's nonsense. It's not going to do that, and this is fraud. If a businessman was doing this kind of thing, they would be prosecuted, and rightfully so. So those are the six crimes we talk about, and obviously we go into much more detail in the book, but I just wanted to give you guys a little introduction to uh, why we call it crimes of the educators. We don't just mean uh, hyperbole, we're not exaggerating, we identify actual crimes that we consider have been perpetrated uh, and are being perpetrated in our country. Uh, so in early America, even uh, before the United States was founded as an independent country, um, literacy was very high. People were very well educated. It was just widely understood that everybody needed to read. And people were mostly educated at home, through their churches, and uh, in occasionally in you know, one-room schoolhouses where you would have kids of all different ages and maybe the community would hire a teacher to help teach them. Uh, John Adams, he said, uh, a native of America who cannot read or write is as rare in appearance as a comet or an earthquake. Uh, I think you'll agree that's pretty rare. Uh, what about today? Um, it's, the situation is very different. Uh, Thomas Jefferson used to brag that U.S. farmers were the only ones in the world who read Homer. Uh, today, kids don't know anything about Homer. Homer Simpson, maybe. It's, you know, it's totally, totally different mindset. And this was hundreds of years ago, long before we were spending a trillion dollars a year on so-called education. Um, and then let's take a look at uh, what's going on today. We, in, in 1983, I mentioned this report previously, Ronald Reagan put together the National Commission on Excellence in Education. Um, this commission, and remember, it's a government commission. They don't normally use incendiary language or uh, fiery rhetoric, but they said the educational foundations of our society are presently being eroded by a rising tide of mediocrity that threatens our very future as a nation and a people. Uh, those are very, very serious words. Is our future as a nation and as a people being threatened? Uh, it absolutely is, and so this commission was 100% correct on that. Uh, <clears throat> they also said that if an unfriendly foreign power had attempted to impose on America the mediocre educational performance that exists today, we might well have viewed it as an act of war. <clears throat> We consider it an act of war. Just because uh, it wasn't an unfriendly foreign power doesn't make it any less nefarious, doesn't make it any less dangerous, and uh, doesn't make it any less an act of war. 
Uh, and then just you know, one quick snapshot. The federal government did a, a literacy survey in 1993. They surveyed American adults, and they found that 55% of Americans could barely read. They were reading in the worst two levels. They were essentially functionally illiterate. Uh, reading a book would be out of the question. Reading a stop sign, maybe, because they memorized the word stop. <laughs> But uh, you know they're essentially functionally literate. They don't read the newspaper. They don't read books for pleasure. They don't read books to acquire knowledge. They do not read. Um, so compare that with what we had during the age of the founders. Uh, remember what Adams said. Obviously, we've fallen a long way, and we're spending wild amounts of money on so-called education. How could we be getting dumber and dumber and dumber? It doesn't make any sense. But uh, as we show in the book, it wasn't a national accident. It was done deliberately, and it's still being done. It's actually accelerating. So how did we get this education system that we call an education system? Uh, Horace Mann was really a key player in this. Now, we don't know that he wanted to dumb down children, but uh, he was a key player in building what today we call the government education system, or the public school system, for those of you who don't like the term government education. Uh, he was the Secretary of Education in Massachusetts, the very first ever education secretary that we had. And uh, he went to Prussia, and he was very impressed with uh, the so-called Prussian model of education, where schooling was mandatory, uh, the state trained up teachers, they segregated the children by ages, attendance was compulsory, and uh, the idea behind these schools, and at least in Prussia, was to instill an obedience of the regime and um, you know, uh, man thought that this would be a good model for the United States. He thought it would equalize men. He also wanted to instill obedience to authority. Uh, he also said he wanted to instill morality, which, you know, obviously the schools don't do that today anymore. But uh, he did play a big role in secularizing the education system. A lot of people don't know this. They think, oh, separation of church and state, which appears, of course, nowhere in the First Amendment. But uh, they think, you know, public schools have always been atheist, nihilist, uh, humanist. And that's not the case. Uh, our, one of our very first education laws in 1640, 47, the old deluder Satan Act in the Massachusetts Bay Colony. Uh, the purpose of this act was to make sure that everybody could read because otherwise they couldn't read scripture and if they couldn't read scripture they would be ignorant and then the devil would come around and uh, exploit the ignorance and get up to no good and destroy the country and destroy the people. And so back in those days education was co considered crucial, literacy was considered crucial. Obviously it's very crucial if you think Satan is going to come around and, uh, and mess with your community, mess with your children. And if you can read the Bible, obviously you can read anything. You can read the Constitution, you can read the Declaration of Independence, you can read your history books. You can read anything, and so you're a well-rounded, well-educated person. Uh, and so Horace Mann promoted this Prussian model all across the country. He wanted the schools to become more secular. He, he said uh, he didn't want uh, sectarianism and so forth in the schools. So um, he succeeded with uh, building this Prussian model, and we'll get back to why that's so important in just a moment. Uh, he was also an advocate of the whole word method, and I'll introduce it here and we'll say more about it as we go on. Um, the whole word method, it was introduced in Boston under Horace Mann, and it was such a disaster that it was pulled out within a few years because children were not learning how to read. So what is the whole word method? What is the look-say method? Sometimes they call it the sight method. Uh, to put it very succinctly, it's like trying to teach a child to read English as if it were Chinese. They're supposed to memorize lists of words. So you'll start with simple words like cat in the hat, and you remember, okay, when I see that combination of lines, that's supposed to mean cat. Uh, and so this is how you would read Chinese, right? You, you look at the word as a symbol rather than decoding what it says based on the phonetic structure and the letters and the sounds that the letters make to make up the whole word. So uh, we have a phonetic alphabet. Obviously, our writing system is very different than the Chinese system. We don't use symbols to represent concepts and, and words. We use letters to create words. And to be able to decode those letters, you have to know what they sound like. An A sounds like eh or uh. Uh, a C and an H together sounds like ch. If you don't understand these things, you're never really going to learn how to read. You might be able to memorize a good amount of words, but you're never really reading. You're memorizing symbols. Um, now, when this was done in the schools in Boston, it was atrocious. It was a disaster. Again, they yanked it out within a few years because it was so bad. Um, and so then it kind of died for a while. Uh, it, now we know it produces dyslexia, it produces permanent reading disabilities, a hatred of reading. It makes children feel that they're stupid. Say, how come I can't read this? You know, I, I, I didn't memorize that word, so I don't know what that word says. Um, and so, you know, here's a, actually an illustration of it here. You can see the picture of the fish, and underneath it says fish, and you're supposed to remember that when you see that combination of lines in that order, that means fish. So you're not reading F-I-S-H, and that, that sounds like fish. You're just memorizing it with a picture. Same thing with the fork there. 
Uh, so that's the whole word method in a nutshell. And it was developed with good intentions. It was developed by a reverend who wanted to teach deaf children how to read. They couldn't hear the phonetic sound of the words, and so that made sense to teach deaf children. But uh, when you try to apply it to non-deaf children, um, you know, substandard doesn't begin to describe it. Uh, so this failed miserably, and it was buried for a very long time. And then came John Dewey. Maybe some of you guys have heard of him. Uh, there's a reason he's called the godfather or the father of progressive education, which is the education system we have all across this country today paid for by our tax dollars. He was a socialist. He was open and very adamant about socialism. He wanted to move America to uh, become a socialist country. He went to the Soviet Union and studied their schools there and thought they, they were doing a wonderful job mass producing atheists and collectivists. He was also a humanist, one of the original humanists, one of the first signers of the Humanist Manifesto, which declared that uh, the universe is self-existing and it was not created. And if you remember the Bible, it says in the beginning, God created. So, uh, you know, these two are fundamentally at odds with each other. So John Dewey had big ideas. He wanted to change our country, fundamentally transform, might be a good way to put it in uh, our day and age. If you remember Obama's rhetoric, he wants to fundamentally transform our country as well. Uh, but John Dewey did that first. Uh, so he came along and he said, well, how am I going to do this? You know, we can't seize America like they seized the Soviet Union. Uh, you know, America is too literate. America is too smart. It's too well educated. They love their liberties. They love their constitution. They're faithful to their God. This is never going to work over here. So he decided to seize control of the education system and dumb down the children. Uh, we have the primary source documents where he outlines his plan to dumb down the children, where he talks about, we don't need to teach little kids how to read. Let's focus on socializing them and making them social creatures and expanding the social consciousness. He considered reading to be an individualistic activity because when you read, it's just you and the book or whatever you're reading. Um, so here's a, a quote from him. I, I had to take out a bunch because I'm very limited on time. Education is a regulation of the process of coming to share in the social consciousness. Uh, is that what you think of as education? I, w when I think of education, I think of reading and writing and uh, arithmetic, not uh, the process of coming to share in the social consciousness. But he says, a adjustment of individual activity on the basis of social consciousness is the only sure method of social reconstruction. So he wanted to reconstruct society. He wanted to engage in social reconstruction. To reconstruct, you need to destroy. And so he wanted to destroy the literacy of our people. And he succeeded, obviously. Um, <clears throat> we'll talk about how in just a moment. He outlined parts of his plan in an essay that we actually reprinted in full in the book, The Primary Education Fetish in 1898, and he blasted the current education regime that focuses on, uh, regime is his word, that focuses on teaching young children how to read and how to write, and that's so superfluous. We need to make them social creatures. Um, and, uh, you know, of course, a guy with wacky ideas like this would, uh, would make a lot of friends at the elite universities. He got a nice position at the University of Chicago, took over some departments. Later, he went to the Teachers College at Columbia University. Uh, and, of course, if you have wacky ideas like this, the Rockefellers will hand over some money. So they had a philanthropy called the General Education Board, and they gave him millions of dollars to try out this quackery in an experimental school and to promote this lunacy and to come up with uh, a coalition of cohorts, many of whom were eugenicists open racist. They claimed science justified their racism. Um, and all of them were united in these beliefs of socialism and humanism and destroying the literacy and the faith of the people of the United States. Um, so here he said in his essay, The Primary Education Fetish, uh, change must come gradually. To force it unduly would compromise its success by favoring a violent reaction. Does that sound like a man with a good idea that he wants to present to the public? Absolutely not. He was very secretive. He wanted to do it quietly. He wanted to do it under the radar because he knew that if parents and if teachers figured out what he was up to, what his cohorts were up to, there would be a violent reaction and it would jeopardize the success of his plot. Um, so the Dewey Plan, basically the central element of it at least, was to promote this whole word method that we discussed earlier uh, in all the government schools. He teamed up with uh, a wide array of uh, fellow humanists and socialists, a lot of whom studied under Wilhelm Wundt at the University of Leipzig, uh, and they introduced behavioral psychology into the schools where you treat the children as, uh, as kind of animals, as stimulus response organisms that you kind of you insert a stimulus and then they react in a certain way, uh, very Pavlovian. Um, a lot, again, were eugenicists. Almost all of them were evolutionists and humanists. And uh, Edward Burke Huey provided the pseudoscientific 
quack basis for uh, this kind of stuff. He said, oh, you know, uh, Dewey's ideas will be great and science says that and we have to do this in all our schools. Uh, of course, they seized control of, uh, you know, two of the prominent teaching colleges, University of Chicago and Teachers College at Columbia. If those sound familiar, they should. Obama's terrorist buddy Bill Ayers comes from both of those. Um, and uh, so they promoted those who had similar beliefs. They tried to get their operatives in charge of the public schools. And they developed reading programs. They came up with whole word books, the Dick and Jane Readers. Some of you might remember those. They came up with the Macmillan Reading Program at Teachers College. And uh, this was all designed to dumb down the American people, to reduce the literacy of the American people. Again, this, it was known to be quackery in the 1840s when they tried it in Boston. So John Dewey said that'll be perfect for our purposes. Um, obviously, this didn't happen overnight. It took a long time. During the Great Depression, the public schools were not really out on a buying spree buying up these books. But uh, eventually they did, after World War II, especially when the United States was the richest uh, superpower in the world, tons of money extra lying around now that we don't have to fight the war. And so they said, okay, let's load up all the government schools with these books. Uh, fortunately, thank goodness, uh, a gentleman by the name of Rudolf Flesch in 1955 wrote a book exposing this. He said, Why Johnny Can't Read? And this is actually one of the books that set Sam, Dr. Blumenfeld, on his lifelong mission of uh, bringing attention to this crucial, crucial issue. So uh, again, you know, it was known to be quackery in the 1840s. Again, it was exposed in 1955. And you probably won't be surprised to learn that this is still going on in government schools across the country even though the effects are known, even though we can look on brain scans now. You can look, do a brain scan on children who have done uh, phonics versus children who have done the whole word method. And what you see is that the brain of someone who learned how to read with the whole word method is wired wrong. It doesn't work as well. It has physical brain damage because you're trying to get the right hemisphere of the brain to do a function that the left hemisphere of the brain is supposed to be doing. Uh, symbols is for the right side of the brain. Reading and writing is for the left side of the brain. When you try to do it backwards, you get brain damage, you get dyslexia, you get the connections wired wrong. And this doesn't just affect literacy. This affects a wide array of other areas. And modern neuroscientists uh, who don't share any of the beliefs that I have uh, have confirmed all of this. Uh, so fast forward to today. Dr. Pest is going to be talking to you about Common Core and how we got here and what this means. So I'm going to skip over that. Uh, and we're just going to move straight to UNESCO and the ideas that these people have uh, for our future. Uh, basically, UNESCO was founded for the purpose of bringing about a global government, global socialism, and global humanism. This was never really a secret. If you read their publications, they're actually quite frank about it. The first Secretary General of UNESCO, and UNESCO uh, is the United Nations Educational, Scientific, and Cultural Organization. So their job was to get involved in education, get involved in so-called science, get involved in the culture, and try to change it, and try to bring about what uh, the first Secretary General, Julian Huxley, described as political unification in some sort of world government. Uh, obviously, if we're going to have a world government, we're not going to have an independent United States anymore. That should go without saying. Uh, in 1949, UNESCO put out a series of pamphlets, and they said schools needed to be used to combat family attitudes. Um, <clears throat> today, UNESCO runs all kinds of global education programs, uh, education for sustainable development. Those of you who've heard the term sustainable development uh, probably know what they're talking about here. It means taking away all your freedom, taking away all your rights, and making you into a sustainable human with no rights who just works for the collective and does what the government says. Uh, they also have education for world citizenship, where they're training your children to become global citizens. Uh, in this new order that they're moving toward. Uh, UNESCO also has training manuals for teachers all over the world. Uh, they have uh, training manuals that push sex education in kindergarten. They want to teach five-year-olds things that I won't even describe because I don't want to offend anybody in the audience. Uh, they also promote the whole word method. Uh, they call it the balanced approach because first you memorize a big list of words and then later they add in a little sprinkling of phonics after your brain is already damaged, after you're already illiterate. And so it's worse than uh, useless. It's atrocious. Uh, they promote humanism openly. They promote multiculturalism and so on and so forth. Uh, they also have what they call the World Core Curriculum. This was developed by UN Under Secretary General Robert Mueller. Uh, he was a very bizarre character. He called himself a disciple of Alice Bailey, who was the founder of the Lucifer Publishing Company. 
Uh, she's a big wig at the UN. She's still very influential. She would uh, invite these spirits to come into her body. She called them ascended masters. Uh, for those of you who believe the Bible, it should be very obvious what these are. And they would supposedly dictate these books to her about education in the New Age and how we need to uh, get rid of the heresy of separateness, you know, the idea that Christians need to be holy and separate from the world. Uh, so she was a very bizarre woman. And uh, Robert Mueller was a very bizarre man. He thought the UN was a, a divine institution that was going to lead us toward this great evolution of humankind and uh, so they want the world core curriculum taught in every school in the world and they say so. Um, the, the world uh, core curriculum must teach the child to see himself as a part of the greater whole is what Robert Mueller said. Uh, the current head of UNESCO is actually an actual communist from the Bulgarian Communist Party, Irina Bokova, with uh, strong ties to the communist regime that enslaved Bulgaria. Uh, they murdered an estimated 222,000 people, and now she's next in line, supposedly, to lead the United Nations. She's, she's been described as the front runner to be the next Secretary General of the broader United Nations. And uh, she just released a column, actually, a few weeks ago, where she says they're going to use the schools to change the values of your children, to change the beliefs of your children and to get us all to become sustainable in the new sustainable world order that they're building. Uh, Arne Duncan thinks this is all wonderful. He calls UNESCO his global partner, and you can find this on the Department of Education's website. He calls them his global partner in the cradle to career education reform agenda. And they do want your children from the time they're in the cradle, and then they want to decide what career they're going to go to. Uh, he brags that the schools are now being used to create green global citizens. Uh, and that education, he says, is a weapon to change the world. Did you know that education was a weapon to change the world? Uh, do you send your children to school to become green global citizens? Uh, if you're like me and probably most parents, no. You know, it doesn't matter if you're liberal, conservative, libertarian, communist. You send your kids to school to learn how to read and to learn how to write and to learn how to do math. And they're not doing any of those things. They're doing the opposite of those things. They're indoctrinating them. They're creating lifelong reading disabilities and they're dumbing down the children. And they want to take this to the global level. Um, one quick quote about, uh, from, straight from a United Nations document about this education for sustainable development, uh, just to, to kind of show you what they really have in mind. Uh, they don't have education in mind. Uh, they say, generally, more highly educated people who have higher incomes consume more resources than poorly educated people who have, tend to have lower incomes. In this case, more education increases the threat to sustainability. So if your children become more educated, they're going to be less sustainable. So how do you feel about that? Uh, hopefully not good. Um, so uh, what about the future? Where are we going from here? Well, uh, it's kind of up to us, right? Uh, UNESCO might get their way. Bill Gates signed an agreement with UNESCO in 2004 to promote master global curriculum and so on. He's also the chief financier of Common Core. Surprise. Uh, he's also a big funder of the UN Population Fund that uh, participates in forced abortions in China, according to testimony in Congress. Big funder of Planned Parenthood. Um, so, you know, that's one route we could go, a global totalitarian education system to dumb down all of our children and, uh, you know, quite literally enslave humanity. Or, uh, as free people, we could take back control of our country, we could take back education, we could promote church schools, home schools, private schools, schools like FPE, uh, co-ops, free market schools, you know, the wonders that we could uh, go toward if we just set our minds to it would be amazing. We could have a renaissance of real education, we could restore proper reading instruction with phonics, we could stop Common Core, and really get the government out of education, especially the federal government. They have no business being involved in education, much less UNESCO, and uh, if we we don't do something about this, the consequences are going to be severe. Um, so that's uh, pretty much all I have to say. I thank you very much for coming and for the opportunity to speak with you, and um, I hope you found it interesting. Thanks.